Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ESIS Long Length to Save webinar. Really looking forward to today's session where we'll be looking at criteria led discharge. So, if this is your first time to this session, just a quick reminder that we have the chat room, which is available at the bottom of your screen, that you will see an icon that says chat. If you click on there, and you should get a box that comes up and you're able to say hello. So say hello and where you're joining from today. And it'll be really good to, to learn more about you, what you're excited about today, what you want to know more about. Have you got any questions? So put them in the <coughs> chat room and we have a team here that will be managing the chat. So criteria lit discharge. One of the things you want to do is just to check out where we think everybody is. Uh, and the, the, there's, there's five questions. Uh, one is... Uh, criteria-led discharge is fully embedded and implemented. Um, one is, um, is you're keen to develop uh, criteria-led discharge and it's partly implemented. Would like to implement criteria-led discharge, but it's facing some challenges, and or your system hasn't uh, considered it. Or if you're not uh, within a, 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 a hospital trust, a CCG, it's possibly not applicable. The team today is uh, Pete Gordon. Some of you may already know Pete. He's quite an entertaining presenter. So let's hope we can uh, uh, deal with that, that pressure today. Um, we've got Spencer, he hasn't got a picture up, but he is quite a good looking boy. Um, and he <laughs> will be uh, doing the chat room, uh, as will Rob uh, and Stephen. And we've got Angela, who's going to be doing some tweeting, and Kate Pound, who is um, going to be our technical support today. So this WebEx series is being created to help you realize the benefits of reducing long length of stay, possible for the patients, their family, staff, we want to learn and connect with others, and that's why the chat room is really quite important because you can actually make links with people who have got uh, some challenges that you can support, or they can support you with your challenges. And we want to have you, help you have a better understanding of your role leading and supporting your organisation. And leadership is really important in this. It's not going to work without leadership. Um, so I'm going to introduce you now to Pete Gordon. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Charlie, and uh, thanks everybody for. Uh, for listening in. So um, what I'm going to talk about today, well let me first of all introduce myself. Hello, my name's Pete Gordon, so I'm a member of the Emergency Care Improvement Support Team, uh, pragmatic group of improvers that like to work across England, sometimes further afield, to spread good practice. So I've been asked to talk about uh, clinical criteria for discharge and criteria led for discharge. And the title of my presentation is A Clear Plan for Every Person. If you do tweet during the webinar, if you could use the hashtags, hashtag home first, hashtag where best next, that would be uh, great. And uh, we'll immediately make these slides available on SlideShare, so as, via Twitter as soon as uh, uh, the session finishes. I'm going to start off by saying, um, with all this stuff, really important to keep it simple. Where do you start? Well, for me, you'd always start. Uh, with the person, uh, with the patient, and so you've got a really good plan. Uh, the person who's uh, you know you're looking after, they should be able to answer four questions. Do I know what is wrong with me, or what you're excluding? Do I know what is going to happen now, later today, and tomorrow? Uh, what do I need to achieve to get home? And this is where the clinical criteria for discharge comes in. What do I personally need to achieve to go home? What's the plan? And uh, plan being back to baseline is. Um, is rarely a useful phrase. And if my recovery is ideal, when can I expect to go home? Uh, quick question here, and this is the first one of our polls that we're going to run um, using uh, the technology, fingers crossed. Practical question for you all. Where should the definitive plan for a patient be written? There are a number of options in front of you. So, you know, uh, should it be in the nursing notes, the therapy notes? somewhere else, an electronic system, the medical notes, or it should be everywhere. Where should it be? So if you get a second, if you could poll now, that would be great. Sorry to interrupt you, Pete. Um, I think the polling options are only available to share via your, your screen. Okay. So I'm just having a bit of technical expertise from my colleague, Rob Kemp. Well, so just have a think about that. Where should the plan? Yeah. Or if we can't do the poll, put the answer in the... Uh, Put the answer in the chat room. Let's move on. So when we're thinking about the plan, um, 
and what makes a really good plan because without a good plan you can't do clinical criteria for discharge you can't do criteria led discharge these are some of the common phrases that we often hear all of us home and stable home and mobile start discharge planning home after the weekend medically fit for discharge when patients back to baseline recheck for tomorrow so i'd ask you to think about those what's you know, they seem really common, those phrases, but what's wrong with them? For me, they're not clear enough. So what may be, you know, home stable for me may be very different to my colleague Charlie, who was speaking earlier on, or home and mobile, well, well how mobile? So they're not specific. They're not specific enough. Um, and I often think um, about uh, one of my uh, uh, colleagues here, Dr. John Day, who works in South End. And he, the way he phrased it when he's thinking about clinical criteria for discharge is often the stuff is in the senior doctor's head, but he or she maybe hasn't shared it. So what are you thinking? I'm thinking about Dr. Day. And if you look at Twitter and follow the Twitter trail afterwards, we'll put a, uh, we'll tweet a video of John talking about just this. So for example, someone has an acute kidney injury, home when AKI recovered. A little bit more specific, creatinine less than 125. Another example, GI bleed. So no evidence for a home where no evidence of further upper GI bleeding, whereas a really good clinical criteria could be no further loose black stool, uh, hemoglobin doesn't drop by more than 10 in 24 hours, asymptomatic postural BP drop of less than 10, OGD to be arranged as an outpatient procedure if not done by the time one to three has been met. And you can see that this is all physiological, clinical, it's really specific. Imagine if that was written down really clearly in every set of medical notes. One more example, pneumonia. So, I mean, I'm, my background, part of my background is I'm an ex-critical care nurse. So I've never had pneumonia, but I've looked after plenty of people who've had pneumonia. So writing down home and patient feels well enough after pneumonia, you could have a very extended long length of stay there because patients typically don't feel well for months. Whereas a good clinical criteria may be a for 24 hours, not requiring oxygen for six hours, neutrophil count less than it was at admission. Again, it's specific. Now, they're physiological criteria, but what we like to encourage in ESIS is to also use functional and emotional criteria. So, for example, um, you know, how far can a patient walk? If a patient only needs to walk 10 meters, you know, that should be enough. So to be specific, uh, and you may have heard of the NPJ paralysis campaign, which a number of us have been heavily involved in uh, trying to promote getting patients up, dressed and moving. Um, I can't tell you how important it is for this to happen and to be specific about it. And each day, every day, the evidence is compelling around this. But also eating and drinking, toileting and asking the person what is really, really important to that person. Have the risks been shared to them? And, you know, have we empowered them to decide? And, you know, wherever possible, can we assess the patient at home? So I'd like to ask you a question there. We were going to do a poll on this, but maybe put it in the chat room. Should functional criteria, such as mobility uh, and these other things that we've just talked about, should they be clearly written in the medical notes? My hunch about this and my experience is that often they are written down, but they may be written down in a set of therapy notes, which is stored somewhere else. Should be, so a question for you, should this be in one definitive place with physiological criteria and functional criteria? Just have a think about that. So just building on that, this, that, this is a, an example, just an example of what would be a good plan, which includes both. So this could be for a COPD patient, treat with oxygen to maintain SATs above 88%, nebulize bronchodilators, oral prednisolone for follow-up with the acute respiratory service at home, team on discharge. Important, clinical criteria, able to maintain saturations without oxygen to the level above, specific, physiological, and then check this out, functional, able to manage the toilet, able to mobilize 10 yards, expected date of discharge, 11 o'clock, 4th of July, 2016, Independence Day. The point there is this, is think about your plans. Have you got in your areas or could you encourage your teams to write a plan as clear as that? 
And before we talk about criteria-led discharge, always start with have our patients got really clear plans. Because really clear plans, what do they give? They give purpose to the patient. They set the expectations to the relative. We know when my mum is going to go home. This is what we need to do. Also, this is what she needs to do, Pete. She needs to walk 10 metres five times a day. Consistency for the multidisciplinary team, confidence for the junior doctors, continuity for the nursing teams, but also clarity for those complex uh, discharge people, such as integrated discharge teams, social care teams, community colleagues. If they can't find a clear plan, it makes their job incredibly difficult, and also assurance for the trust. And uh, we'll tweet out a few of the sort of links and stuff, but we have a fair amount of resources online. So, you know, if you Google expected date of discharge and clinical criteria for discharge, you can see our rapid improvement guide. We also have a YouTube channel, so if you Google ESIS1, uh, lots of videos on there. So I'm going to move on to criteria-led discharge, and um, I'm not going to talk every word of this slide, but this is, this is from uh, the work of Dr. Liz Lees Deutsch and Jane Robinson. Liz is a, an acute, um, consult, uh, acute medicine uh, consultant nurse, but she's also just finished a PhD. She works for the NIHR and is a modestly brilliant uh, nurse. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit about her work shortly. And Jane Robinson, who works in the nursing directorate with NHS England and NHS Improvement. Both of these people are my mentors in this subject. And the information they've produced on it is there and ready to be accessed. And this is a type of information, and uh, they don't know I'm using their pictures today, so um, here they are. And these are um, um, things which are online and ready to use. So what does the evidence say? And I'm using Liz's slides here, word for word. So is criteria-led discharge safe? Yes, from the evidence that's available at the moment. It is dependent upon processes and localization, but in terms of does the evidence at the moment say it's safe? Yes. Does criteria-led discharge reduce length of stay? Based on the studies to date, which are primarily surgical, is yes, they reduce delays. What it doesn't do, it definitely doesn't do, it doesn't increase length of stay. So from that, my hypothesis is, and our hypothesis is, is that it's a good thing. This is something which is gonna reduce unnecessary waiting and save patients time. And when we think of patients time, we're thinking about the most important currency in healthcare. This is something that should trump everything else. Any CIP plan you've got, any project initiation document you've got, put patient's time above everything else. So it's the right thing to do. Uh, and when Liz talks about this, she talks about what are the enablers for criteria-led discharge, and none of these will surprise you, executive support, uh, a pre-audit of the current process, agreeing a set of uh, measures, giving clinical teams time to do it, uh, establishing a multidisciplinary group of people, and we'll give a few examples in a minute, and they do exactly uh, this uh, type of stuff. They get people together and develop clearly defined criteria uh, and processes to support it. And her key points are, uh, it requires a review of the whole discharge process. It should be not an add-on, it should be part of the usual discharge process. It needs outcome measures, so a reduction in long length of stay, a reduction in overall length of stay, improved discharge time, things like that. Uh, and it should help practitioners, the multidisciplinary team, to take charge of uh, the revised discharge process. Success will come to those who can show they can safely adapt elements of their existing discharge process with clear, robust discharge criteria. But, you know, so that's the sort of thing. So the evidence says it's a good thing. Uh, the aim is to save patients time, uh, but let's talk about a few, a few examples, and I'm just going to talk uh, around a few. And this is a really recent example. I'd like to um, thank my colleague, Mark Ellis, who's an improvement manager who's been supporting East Kent. But this is the work um, from the team there, and this is a slide set from a couple of matrons called Paula Knight and Maria Jenner. And the first slide I didn't put on here was we just gave it a go. And this is the type of thing that we'd encourage is where are you going to start with this? Start small, don't go big bang, give it a go. So they had a set of goals which seemed really reasonable. We want to reduce length of stay, improve patient and staff experience, um, 
and they wanted to be clear on what criteria led discharge is and they quoted Liz Lise Deutsch um, and it's commonly misinterpreted as transference of total responsibility for the discharge decision from doctors to nurses and that's not what it is at all. Uh, what did they do? They formed a group and then they busted a few myths. So one of the things was it's extra work, it's another job for us to do. Well, it's sort of what we do already, the work's already there. This isn't really about quality. Their response is, this is all about quality. I may miss discharging my patients. Nursing teams have always been the last contact for discharging patients. So after the initial meeting, what did they do? They developed some SOPs, they developed some forms, uh, they involved the junior doctors who were absolutely crucial to this process because when we're thinking about criteria-led discharge, you know, it could be a nurse, could be a therapist, but at the weekend, it could also be a junior doctor. And we know from a lot of our talks with junior doctors, they are very reluctant to uh, discharge patients who they don't know at the weekend, and quite reasonably so, unless there is a crystal clear plan. So did they, they develop the rhythm of the process, uh, which was incorporated as part of their board rounds in the morning and their afternoon huddles? Uh, they had a real focus on trying to improve things at the weekend. And they developed the board round checklist. And you know what did they what did they achieve? So I'll go straight to that. I think, and this is just one of their awards. So this isn't the whole trust at the moment. One of their awards, and I've just circled there the impact that they've had on Friday. Saturday and Sunday, and this is from no, this is the uh, 2018-19, um, sorry, November 18, October 19, and November 19, and you can see the increase in the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and actually, our hunch is that's really transferable to other places, and a lot of places that have really focused on this have focused on about getting great plans ready for the weekend. Uh, so uh, patients don't wait unnecessarily. So I, I mean, I think that's just a good practical example. I've seen some other good results in terms of reductions of long length of stay patients, patients have been for 21 days plus, and this is part of that. It's not the only silver bullet. And I'm gonna move on briefly to another example, and this is from South Warwickshire. I'd like to thank my colleague, my professional wife, uh, Josie Nipani, who's the Deputy Medical Director there, one of our clinical directors, and is also now the National Clinical Long Length of Stay Lead. Um, anyone who knows Jyoti, she's a doctor with the most energy uh, that you'll ever meet. But this is the story of Von Ward, Avon Ward, who had already done things like Active Specialty Pull Consultant of the Week. This is the ward where lots of things are in place, but they wanted to add to that. And one of the things that they, yeah, you know, they found was a slightly risk-averse culture, uh, and people, you know, not that keen on taking risks. But you know, the question, the answer to that was, how about if we all shared responsibility and shared the risks? And what were the sort of the attitudes to criteria-led discharge, uh, which which make it, which are conducive to criteria-led discharge? It needs to be a flattened hierarchy. All the teams we work with, there's trust between, typically between medical teams nursing teams, therapy teams, and other teams. There's the uh, culture where you can have respect for challenge. Uh, no member of the team leaves until all the jobs are completed. Um, and if you finish your work, help others. And I think this, uh, this board's a good example about that. So how did CLD come about? Well, what they identified was weekend discharges had to wait for medical review prior to discharge, which caused patients to, de uh, to uh, have delays. And the nurses started to say, do you know what, we can facilitate some of the discharges if you can tell us exactly what is needed. So again, it's going back to John Day's uh, slide, what's in your head, Dr. Day? Can we have it written down really clearly? And there's a potential for an increase in weekend discharges. So the aims were set criteria and agree them, and then agree if it's a nurse discharge or a junior doctor discharge. So some may be slightly different but no need to wait for somebody who's senior. Uh, and so they tested it in September 2018, audited, measured uh, the impact, which I'll talk about in a second. And they used a number of things uh, for criteria-led discharge, as well as the trust between the teams, especially if you're going into a weekend, a pro forma seems to be pretty necessary. Uh, there's lots of examples of these which we can share. And what we'd advise you to do is just localize it a bit. 
so they took, I think, the one from John Day's trust and adapted it to meet the needs uh, on the board. Uh, and then the performance sort of looks like this, which is, you know, pretty straightforward. Name of the consultant who's in charge of the care. Uh, you know, are they suitable for CD? What are the criteria? Um, and uh, my experience of working with teams on this is they continually tend to modify uh, the process. So the process, first process, uh, part one, start thinking about patients suitable for criteria-led discharge on the Thursday board round. Uh, all the team agree and it's healthy to challenge. Firm up the list on the Thursday board round. Make sure this is communicated to the patient family on Thursday. TTOs are done for those patients between Thursday afternoon and Friday morning. The tasks are allocated and check again on the Friday uh, board round. Uh, Friday afternoon, criteria-led discharge stickers with clear criteria put on patients' notes uh, so everyone's aware the complexity of the patient is decided whether it's a nurse or a doctor discharge. And that's only allocated after discussion. And it's, a, you know, there's acceptance from all the team. And then there's a close in the loop thing after the weekend. So the Monday morning, review the list to check if any patients were not discharged uh, and then have a discussion around it. What were the challenges? Well, lack of confidence. This is something new. And we all know it's something new. There'll be a sort of hesitancy. Uh, some people go with it. Some people will, mm, I'll think about it. I'll see what happens. So a bit of hesitancy, lack of understanding. Why do we need to change what we're already doing? We're already doing well. Uh, this will be extra work, so similar to the last case study. Perhaps try an award with much longer length of stay. And these, you know, some of the barriers that, you know, I guess everybody would face would be confidence within the nursing team, junior doctors feeling there's more work, Friday handovers are too long, um, finding justifications to delay discharge, and probably finding lots of barriers where, I'll be honest with you here, guys, if you think to what's the key aim here, that is reducing patients' waiting. If you start with that, I think what you'll find is this is something which will help. Uh, so overcoming these barriers, agreeing that the risks are shared. For nursing teams, which is my profession, uh, if you work with a team where the risk is shared across all the professions, you will always feel more confident. Uh, make sure that confidence is there because of all putting the sticker on the notes. Supporting junior doctors when completing exception reporting. Junior doctors are a gift I mean, I do have a great support for junior doctors, and actually they, if you engage them in this type of work, uh, they tend to be very good because that's part of their training to have to do a quality improvement project, and this is a great example of that. Uh, allowing people to peel off the after handovers when they're not needed, and helping them to plan the weekend work. And then these are the results. So these are typically uh, the things that people are interested in from, um, from this specific ward. So a number of patients, Discharge using criteria about 75%, and not you know it's never going to be perfect. Some fail due to medical reasons. We know patients become unwell. Some for social care reasons, which are typically packages of care or nursing home placements wasn't ready to start, or uh, family concern. But the majority of patients they highlighted uh, went home using criteria-led discharge, and you know we could nitpick at these pictures here, but they're typically clinical. Remember what I said about functional. It would be good to get functional criteria in then, but they're specific, aren't they? Um, and, you know, what are their results? Well, in terms of length of stay, this is a ward with pretty good overall length of stay. They've introduced physician of the week or consultant of the week, an active pull, but then when they added criteria, they discharge on top, they saw a further reduction in uh, length of stay. And then when a lot of you will be thinking about weekend discharges, and you can sort of see over the years on this board and what the prediction is for the year that's just about to finish, 2019 and 20, you can see the gradual increase in weekend discharges. And the reason for that is criteria-led discharges. The reasons we've talked about, this is a team where there's trust between them. They have a unified shared purpose, which is let's test some stuff out and let's see if we can reduce unnecessarily unnecessary delays. What they also found by introducing this, they found their total number of discharges throughout the week increased as well. So a quote by a consultant, I take a junior doctor or nurse with me on the ward round primarily because they can challenge my management plan and push the boundaries. And then I guess that's more, that's still around the sort of culture. What are the lessons learned? It's a culture lane, culture change. Do you know what? The sticker's important, but it's not just about the sticker. 
it's not just about weekend discharges. You could start there. It will have an effect on weekday discharges. Uh, it's part of the Safer Patient Flow Bundle, but anyone who knows me knows that I would say that. It's part of that bundle, which is all patients have a plan. All patients can answer those four questions. You know, and when I think about that, I'll be honest with you, you know, the most complex person I know is my son, who's, I've got four sons, and one of them's 18. Um, if he doesn't have a plan, uh, he can't talk, uh, everything goes wrong. Uh, he becomes violent, he causes hassle for everybody involved. So when I think about this, I think to myself, is that plan good enough for Alfie? I don't care who discharges him. He's two to one care. He's completely 100% healthcare CHC funded. Do you know what? I don't mind if it's a nurse, a doctor, uh, a therapist who discharges him, but he does need to leave on time and I do need to know what happens. So it fits as part of the Safer Patient Flow Bundle. All patients have a plan, even the most complex ones, even the people who can't talk, even society's most vulnerable. Um, and it's, you know, it's also a good tool for discharging patients uh, a bit earlier. So I've talked uh, a fair amount. Uh, I've given a couple of examples. Um, I think now is probably a time for a few questions and a bit of a discussion. Um, should we start maybe with a couple of questions that come out of the, yeah. uh, the chat room, Pete? Would that, yeah. would that help? Um, there's uh, a number of questions around other examples, of course. Yeah. Um, one of them was around therapy-led. Um, have you got any examples around rehab areas um, and using criteria-led discharge on, on those sorts of environments? Yeah, there's lots of uh, examples of that. And I mean, actually, rehab areas, non-acute areas, tend to be really, really good at this type of stuff because they don't have lots of doctors around. Uh, we could probably provide examples of uh, that. What I'd say is that we tend to, at the moment, we struggle to find to provide examples, non-surgical examples at scale. Uh, whereas, you know, if you look around, so yeah, rehab you could do. Do you want me to tell you where it routinely does it across the whole country? Mm. Every day surgery unit today, now, will have a group of nurses. My wife runs a day surgery ward, uh, and you know what? She and her team will be discharging 40 patients this afternoon with not one input from one doctor. And if you said to her, tell me, Karen, where's the governance and the very strict protocols and the rules for all this type of stuff, She'd go, I have no idea, absolutely no idea. It's just the way we do things around here. I'll tell you a story about that, actually, if you like, Rob. There was one time she had an emergency patient on one part of the ward, and, uh, and the rules were you can't, nurses can't discharge them. The criteria is fairly clear. Um, and on her day surgery part of the ward, they could discharge patients, which was 20 metres in between. So do you know what she did? She moved the bed 20 metres with her mate, Sean, because the rules changed by moving it 20 metres, and then this is charged the emergency patient. So sometimes we get a bit busted by rules and myths. I think our message here is start small, give it a go. There are examples out there, but you know what? Create your own examples. Um, you, you mentioned then, or oh, certainly there's some questions around cohorts and who should the team start with. Um, so a number of comments about w where we should start. You also mentioned then that surgery might have some of the principles already embedded. Yeah. So is there any sharing across those areas? That Do you know what? Sometimes what you find, I mean, we're a bit fortunate in ESIS because we're like nomadic uh, travellers. So we just go everywhere. And one of the advantages, I don't think we're particularly, you know, bright than anyone else, but what we do is we see lots of things. Have a wander around your hospital. Go around some of the surgical wards. I know day surgery is much simpler than, you know, uh, it's not as simple as it used to be. Actually, a lot of complex patients going in there who I think if we're admitted to an inpatient ward, they might keep hold of because they're full of, you know, comorbidities. Go and have a chat in your own hospital. Uh, where would I start? I'd probably start on one ward where there's a likelihood of success, where there's a doctor who's interested. And uh, doctors are interested in this, maybe some junior doctors who are interested, therapists. Um, and uh, real nursing enthusiasm. But you know what I'd start with? I'd start with anything to do with this, with a shared sense of purpose. What are we trying to do here? It shouldn't be some sort of top-down management stuff. The latest new thing from above is this. Thou shalt do it and create a project initiation document. And when I was a, you know, a practicing nurse, I hated that type of, I'm going to try not to swear today, I hated that type of nonsense. 
But if you said to me, what we're trying to do, <coughs> we're trying to save some time, uh, is this good enough for my mum? Is this good enough for Alfie? Is this good enough for my dad? It's a good place to start. Start somewhere. Okay. Um, a couple of um, some perhaps more nitty gritty questions, right. if, you, if you like. Um, how do you um, mitigate functional criteria keeping patients in the acute hospital uh, when they've been medically optimised and, and so preventing them from moving to a step down bed? How do you how do you how do you see that picture emerging? How would you, how would you look at that? Say it again. Well, if you've got a patient, I'm, uh, hopefully I'm uh, reflecting your question okay here, Alex. Um, is uh, how do you manage the functional criteria keeping patients in the acute instead of being stepped down to rehab once they've been medically optimised? Well, it's, there's probably quite a long answer to that. I mean, this is one element of it, isn't it? Towards the end is, you know, before you're thinking about criteria discharge, there should be a plan which includes functional criteria. I mean, hospitals are perfectly well-designed deconditioning warehouse units. Uh, so, you know, if patients for some reason can't leave hospital, they should be up, dressed and moving wherever possible. And uh, we've seen enough examples of that using volunteers, using patients' relatives, um, and those type of things. Um, that probably does, is not a very, very good answer to that question, I'm thinking to myself. No, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one, isn't it, when yeah. you've got a step-down opportunity um, and, you know, how do you, how do you well, manage that? I mean, one of the things about the step-down, the natural default from a bed to a bed, you know, which is something which we always think home first, so wherever possible is, you know, thinking about that rather than transferring to a bed to bed. As soon as you transfer someone from a bed to a bed, the plan restarts, the handover happens, something gets lost, someone then starts saying, what's your baseline? Oh, we're not sure if you've got rehab potential, <laughs> you know, those type of things. So, uh, I mean, we advocate home first wherever possible and then assess. Yeah. The evidence around that is when people are assessing their own homes, the outcome's slightly different, generally. Okay, thank, thank, thank you, Pete. Um, Stefan and Spencer, is there any questions that you might be able to bring to bear here? Uh, so we've we've had a couple of questions uh, around where it's been working well, and um, if people could share um, those systems if they know of where, where places have been working well. The other thing is there's been some specific um, questions around um, therapy-led wards and respiratory wards is, is where people are looking uh, for some good examples of it. Earlier on when you posed the questions about um, where should CCD be kept, we had some interesting um, feedback around that. It was predominantly yeah. in the patient notes, but also it was felt that there should be MDT records and that's where it was. And interestingly enough, there was a couple that picked out that it should sit with the patient as well, uh, which was very encouraging to hear. In terms of functional criteria um, for discharge, there, there was an absolute agreement across the board around that. And that was reflected that they should be in the medical notes. Uh, we've had lots of people asking for the slide sets, which obviously we will share after this, as you've already mentioned, Pete. Yeah. But other than that, it, it's, it's um, really just sharing um, where people have felt that it's worked well, really. And we've had some good examples as well as um, using volunteers around ascertaining patients' current level of knowledge and engagement within the process by the MDT teams as well. So there's a couple of things there. So I'm really pleased that people say it should be in typically in one place. Uh, uh, I'll be honest, having run some sessions with junior doctors, they won't discharge a patient at the weekend unless it's in the medical notes and it's really clear. The functional criteria, I guess on this call, we're likely to have converts. I can, I can see Siobhan Malunda on my computer, who's a great convert, an ex uh, ESIS person, doing a great job in the middle of um, Essex. Is, my guess is that, I mean, one of the things actually with the examples is people want to create a network around this, around clinical criteria for discharge. If you want to do that, we can do that. And we're very, very happy to do that because that's how you get a bit of social movement and things like that. There is sporadic work going on around the country. If you're up for it, when you get the slides emailed to you in PDF format, why don't you reply to say you would like to take place in the network? Kate. Um, I was just going to add to that as well. It was part of the exciting news is that we are building a website currently and people will be invited to this so we can build, put that into part of the network. Yeah. So, and it'll be a great place where people can share and connect and learn from each other. So, um, I was just going to um, ask 
Pete, about training, because I know this has been an issue that um, some hospitals have struggled with, is keeping up with um, making sure the staff have the skills to follow, you know, the they have the competencies for criteria led discharge. And I know one hospital, because of the staff turnover, are actually currently building an online training programme. So I just wondered if you have any thoughts that you could suggest to help people with that. Yeah, do you know do you know what? So the East Kent example. Um, so I haven't really been involved. So uh, you know, I got the uh, I know uh, Paul of the Matron, uh, but my colleague Mark Ellis, who's an East Improvement Manager, has been supporting them. Is they did have a competency framework for the nurses, and it needs to be good enough. And the, one of the reasons for having that, so it doesn't need to be. Uh, I need to pick my language so I can be a bit inappropriate, guys. But it needs to be right. It needs to be good enough. And a big part of it is that people are confident. So at the weekend, you know, if there's two nurses on for 25 patients and there's students and actually it needs to be something which people feel okay to do. So I think that's a good thing. I mean, one of the things is having a central place to share stuff. And if you want us to put on a sharing event, if that would be useful, we could do that. Not a chalk and talk where we're talking at you, which is sort of what I'm doing now, um, is where you want just a sharing of great practice. We could do that if there was an ask, uh, if you wanted us to do that. Anything else? Any other questions? Um, I've reposted a request for questions on the on the chat room. Okay. So please, um, please chuck um, chuck your thoughts up there. Yeah, and it's really nice to see so many email addresses coming through. So if you're not able to view the slides, they will be shared around after. Elisa, I tried sending them to you just as an example, but your email doesn't seem to want to accept them. I tweeted them. We could put the link to slide share on the chat room, Rob. Perfect. Okay. So I think at this stage, um, we shall talk about the next session. So next week, which I'm really excited about, um, is going to be focusing on job planning. And this is a really you know, exciting opportunity to really kind of like dig deep and think about how we can involve our clinical colleagues in um, long length of stay. So you know, what can we do within job planning? How can we create job plans? And what are the challenges that people face? So it'll be a really great discussion. And we'll be having our clinical team from um, ESIS lead that session. So I hope you can join. Now, just please take note, it is at a different time. Um, so it is at half past 11 next week. So don't come on at half past 12, otherwise we'll all be gone. So just remember to come on early next week. And just a quick reminder that um, we'll have job planning next week, and then we'll have um, a, you know understanding the data that we collect. So what's the DPTL? What's it all about? And what can we learn from it? And then on the 5th of May, we'll be looking at um, focus. So this is where a chance to learn about the new focus model that's being developed and how that can support um, site operations. And just finally, a real like ask is that we're now building our next set of webinars. So could you please put in the chat room what subjects would you like us to cover? Um, Red to Green has come out loud and clear. We've had lots of requests for that. We've had some requests for SAFER, looking at SAFER model again, um, Safe Care Bundle. So just tell us what is, you know, what areas are you struggling with? What would really help your teams? And we can build around the requests. So thank you all, everybody. Um, if you want to Put your email address in the chat room and then we can make sure you all get the slides. And I think that's the end of the session today. That's it. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, yeah. thank you for your input.